There's more mischief, mayhem, and nefarious goings-on in the city of brotherly love than Billy Penn could have ever imagined. We've got it all here on the Twisted Billy Podcast. True crime, haunted history, the coolest and creepiest places to visit. Welcome, Welcome to, to Twisted, Twisted Billy. Billy. Hey, Twisters, what up? Welcome back to another sordid episode of Twisted Philly. Is anyone else sick and tired of turkey? I took the leftover turkey meat we had and I made soup last week. And then when I was about to pack some turkey soup for lunch at work, I was like, I can't. I just simply cannot. So that shit went in the freezer for another day. My house is looking quite festive, if I do say so myself. I've got one tree up in the living room, and it's a little three-foot tree. It's real, but it's tiny, and it's up on a table because one of my knucklehead dogs has made it impossible to put up a tree that could actually stand on the floor. Between attempting to eat it or pee on it, that was just too much for me to handle. So the big tree gets moved to the basement, or it will once I buy it. I'm a real tree kind of girl. Strap that sucker on the roof of my car, and I drag that monstrous huge tree through the house, down the steps to the family room. I am woman, hear me roar. Single moms have these giant chips on their shoulder, or at least this single mom does. I don't want to speak for everyone. So over the years, when my lovely neighbors have offered the assistance of their husbands to help get my tree in the house, I politely and graciously decline. Because all the while, in my head, I'm thinking, what, don't you think I can get this sucker in the house? Watch and learn, biatches. Watch and learn. I have a Charles Griswold complex when it comes to Christmas trees. I think I live in a house with cathedral ceilings when in fact I do not. And the family room ceiling is even lower than the rest of the house because it's in the basement. So it's gotten really ridiculous when I try to put a tree in the stand and then I have to cut at least a foot off the top. Every year I say I'm buying a smaller tree and every year my daughter tells me it's too big but I don't believe her because they look so freaking small in the lots. But this year, I am committed to purchasing an appropriately sized tree for my space. Yeah, I don't even believe that bullshit. Before I jump into this week's twisted and nefarious story, let's talk about something called CrimeCon. Now, I didn't know crime conventions were a thing, but they are. I wish they were like Comic-Con so we could play cosplay. I'd probably dress as Lizzie Borden in period clothes covered from head to toe in blood and a big fake axe that looks real as shit, but I'd make it out of resin or something so it couldn't actually hurt anyone. I wonder if I could convince the CrimeCon folks to have a cosplay. Or maybe I could just show up in costume, even though it's not an official CrimeCon cosplay thing. So CrimeCon is June 9th through 11th in Indianapolis, Indiana, and their website describes the event as a celebration of all things true crime. CrimeCon brings the cases you love to life through immersive experiences, incredible guests, and a ton of mystery and intrigue. This is a weekend to celebrate your interest and even your obsession with true crime. Twisted Philly will be there along with a number of amazing podcasts like Insight, Already Gone, Once Upon a Crime, and so many more. Advanced registration before December 31st gets you the best price, but they still have discounts through February. And if you use code TWISTED20, you get an extra 20% off your registration. I signed up for demonstrations. Now, I have no idea if I will be selected, nor what the hell I could be demonstrating, but as you guys can probably guess about me, I'm sort of game for anything. It's time in Twisted Philly for a few what-ups. This week's first what-up goes out to my friend Heather, who listens to Twisted Philly a little farther up the turnpike. Heather, girl, I am always thinking of you, even though we don't get to see each other as often as we used to. But I am always here for you, chicky. What-ups also go out to the Twisters who took time to leave me reviews on iTunes. I so appreciate it because the more people that subscribe and review... Well, then the easier it is for new listeners to find us and join this twisted family. What up to Caleb? Man, you wish I was your friend. That just warms my heart. Louisa GJR, you don't have to live in Philly to be an honorary Philadelphian. And little Miss KMS, what up, Jersey girl? And what up to Nemo Jones? <sighs> Booze around a bonfire sounds fantastic, my friend. Nemo said this podcast is so good he wants to throw batteries at it. I fucking love that. That's 
awesome. I also have to throw a few what ups to some Twitter followers who have been so supportive, retweeting episodes from me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Zukov43, Fan Film Boys Pod. These guys host a podcast about fan films, which is one of my crazy passions. Wretched Girl, who is a co-host of the Dark Angels and Pretty Freaks podcast. Like, that has to be the absolute best podcast name ever. Pod Sheep and Z, a crime blogger and podcast junkie. And as always, DeSativa99 and Maria. And lastly, I want to give a what up to listener Jessica, who actually reached out about the case I'm going to be talking about a few months ago. Jessica, this has been on my list for a while, and I hope you think it was worth the wait. And now, without further ado, Twisters, I present to you Arsenic Incorporated, the story of the South Philly Poison Ring. Oh, we got poison right here in Twisted Philly. That starts with T and that rhymes with P and that stands for poison. And I just riffed on the music, man. <laughs> <laughs> that, my friends, is paying a little homage to all the Twisters who grew up in theater just like me. We're going back in time, something you guys know I absolutely love to do. I'd say we're going back to a simpler time, but dodging a poison ring doesn't sound all that simple to me. Philadelphia in the 1930s, much like the rest of the country, was suffering from the Great Depression. But unlike the rest of the country, while they were facing a 15% unemployment rate, Philly was doing so much worse at a 25% unemployment rate. There were about 2 million residents in the city of Philadelphia then, so we're talking about a half a million people out of a job. That's a lot of stressed out, desperate people in one city. And the tragic thing about so many out-of-work people was there were factories that sat idle because businesses went under, especially businesses like the textile industry, which was a huge part of the Philly economy. And a decline in textiles means a large population of tailors were out of work too. And in Philly, the population actually declined in the late 30s. Less people were getting married, less people had babies. I mean, how could you provide for a wife and child? Women certainly weren't encouraged to provide for themselves back then. The city started to fall apart little by little. More people suffered from malnutrition and medical neglect. The lack of human care was equal to the lack of city care. So streets weren't being repaired, like street lights were left broken. People could barely hold on to their homes. And if you could hold on to your home, you couldn't afford to do much maintenance to it. So the city just got shabby. The late 30s and 40s were pretty damn rough all over, and especially in Philly. In desperate times, some people see an opportunity. The dregs of humanity are attracted to people's desperation. The scum of the earth look at others' misfortune as an open door to take advantage of their fellow man and woman, and Philly was rife with opportunity to scam and bamboozle and swindle and steal. Enter the Petrillo Cousins, stage left. The Petrillo boys, or at least one of them, possessed a very particular set of skills. Skills they acquired over a very long career. Skills that became a nightmare for the city of Philadelphia. Yeah, I just riff taken too. <laughs> but it works, right? It kind of works. So what were these skills? So what were these skills? Paul Petrillo started out as a reputable tailor. He emigrated to Philly from Naples, Italy in 1910, and soon after he opened up his own tailor shop. He was called Paul Petrillo, the tailor to classy dressers, and his business thrived. Philly was a city known for expert tailors, especially in the 20s and 30s, but when the textile industry collapsed during the Depression, Paul lost his shop and was facing financial ruin. His cousin Herman Petrillo emigrated from Campania the same year as Paul, but he didn't really start out as a legitimate businessman like his cousin. He tried his hand as a barber, but Herman thought there had to be an easier way to make a buck. Easy, sure. Legal? Yeah, not so much. Arson seemed like a good idea to Herman, but it didn't last long because you burn down a bunch of buildings and eventually someone's going to start asking questions. A chance encounter with a couple of guys even more unscrupulous than Herman introduced him to the art of counterfeiting. And Paul, well, what's an out-of-work tailor supposed to do? Insurance scams, that's what. He sold cheap policies with 50-cent premiums to the elderly and the infirm. You ever hear the expression, one foot in the bed and one in the grave? Well, that describes Paul's perfect customer. As if that wasn't sleazy enough, he would list himself as a brother or a cousin of the insured when there was little to no family to be found, and then he would reap the insurance benefits. 
As if these two screw-ups weren't enough, let's just add another player to this sordid story. Dr. Morris Bulber, or Louis the Rabbi, as he was known to his friends, and he wasn't really a rabbi. I mean, you guys probably guessed that. Bulber was a Russian immigrant who came to America just after the Petrillos in 1911. Growing up in Russia, he was kind of a genius. He started Russian University when he was nine, and then he graduated when he was 12 and became a tutor. Because, you know, child labor wasn't really a thing in the late 1800s. While he was tutoring, he discovered the Kabbalah, and Mars Bulber became obsessed with mysticism. In 1905, he traveled to China to study with a sorceress. Now, I don't know if she really was a sorceress or a hack, but Bulber lived with her for five years, learning to make potions and poisons. Mars Bulber landed in America in 1911, and he lived in New York for almost 20 years, running a successful grocery store until 1931, and, you guessed it, the Depression. So no more grocery store. So it was time for the Bulber family to move, and he said Philadelphia is the place we ought to be, so they loaded up the truck and they moved to Philly, which had a slew of desperate unemployed people and a couple of con artists just waiting for a partner to form a nefarious trio. Mars Bulber set up shop in Philly as a faith healer and added the initials DR before his name, and it was Morris who first conceived the nefarious plan enabling him and the Petrillo cousins to get rich quick. And it started in 1932. So, Bulber had a female patient who complained about her husband's infidelity. What she should have been complaining about was the fact that she was seeing a quack, but in any case, enter Paul Petrillo. Bulber and Petrillo concocted a scheme where Paul would seduce this neglected woman and convince her to buy a life insurance policy on her husband. Then Morris and Paul would murder her husband and split the insurance windfall with the wife. The policy was valued at $10,000 in 1932, which today would be worth about $120,000. The first victim of this duo was a man named Anthony Giscabe. Anthony was a known alcoholic, and one cold winter night when he was passed out drunk, his wife stripped him of his clothes and left him next to an open window where he caught his death of cold. Literally, he died from a combination of consumption and medical neglect. When Paul realized how easy the scam was, he went in search of more miserable married women who might be interested in making a bundle at their husband's demise. But see, the problem was most men, and I should say most Italian men, because this group seemed to predominantly attack Italian immigrants. But these men already had insurance policies in their own names. Enter Herman Petrillo. Paul's firebug cousin, who, when we last checked on him, was busy learning the art of counterfeiting. Herman was also a part-time actor, so who better to play the part of potential victims? Herman pretended to be the husbands of miserable wives who reached out to Morris and Paul for help. He would then purchase life insurance as if he was really their husband. He'd make a couple of payments because they were really cheap, and then BAM! The real husband would meet his demise in either a tragic accident or harmless natural causes. Yeah, natural causes my ass. Murder was their business and business was good. After about a dozen murders, the boys expanded their business to include matchmaking. They partnered with a woman named Karina Maria Favado. Karina was another faith healer, but in her old traditional and superstitious Italian immigrant neighborhood, she was called the witch. She was the kind of woman who would put the malocchio on you, or the maloik, the evil eye, and eventually you would succumb to the evil eye curse and suffer great misfortune or physical ailments. So I'm part Sicilian, and I gotta be honest, I am superstitious as hell. Like, do not open an umbrella inside around me. I have actually cried when people have done that. Like, I am a total freak with umbrellas. Karina wasn't a witch, but she was a marriage consultant, as in, you want to get rid of your husband, make some money, maybe find a new husband, and then get rid of him, make some more money. Her curses, or witch's brew, were nothing more than arsenic. Now, the Petrillo brothers and Bulber couldn't let Karina Favato corner the market on murder for hire, so instead of competing with her, they brought her in and partnered up with her. By that point, she had already killed three men in her own family. Her first husband, Giuseppe Di Martino, she collected almost $2,000 for his death. Then she killed her common-law husband, Charles Ingrao. She got eight grand for him. 
And then she killed her stepson, Charles's son, Philippe. And for Philippe, she got almost $7,000. That's a lot of money for a hopeless, lonely widow in 1935. Like, that's 200 grand today. And with the addition of Karina Favato and her long list of potential clients, the Philly Poison Ring was officially sprung. Over the next two years, these twisted fucks killed off more than 50 men, mostly out-of-work immigrants, struggling to support themselves, their wives, in some cases families. Now, I'm not saying these guys were all good guys. Some were shiftless, some were abusive, but for the 50 or more murders in the city of Philadelphia that were uncovered, there were countless others that were either unsolved or undocumented. After the investigation, it's possible that this crew, either on their own or once they teamed up, killed as many as over 115 people between 1932 and 1938. That is insane! That's almost a murder a month. So how did these guys get caught? Well, besides the obvious reasons, right? Hello, you're killing a bunch of people. Well, someone sung like a canary. A gentleman named George Meyer was down in his luck. Now, he was just released from prison in 1938, and he was trying to start an upholstery cleaning business. I don't know whose upholstery he would be cleaning with so many people losing their homes and their belongings, but that was his dream. And George knew about the Petrillos, especially about Herman Petrillo and his counterfeiting business. So he caught up with Herman and asked to borrow some money. Not a good idea, George. Herman made George an offer. He could borrow $600 cash or $2,500 in counterfeit cash if George would do a little job for Herman. Herman needed someone killed. A man named Ferdinand Alfonsi. Now, Ferdinand wasn't anyone special. He was poor. He was a day laborer. He was someone who got up every day and wandered the city looking for work, sometimes getting picked up for a job here and there just for a day. But like so many other poor Italian men in South Philadelphia, Ferdinand was on the hit list because of a pissed off wife. Herman Petrillo suggested George Meyer hit Alfonsi in the head with a pipe, then toss him down a flight of steps. The crime ring wanted it to look like an accident so that a double indemnity clause would kick in. Gee, these guys, you know, they think of everything. Herman even had a pipe for George that he could use. George was desperate, so he went as far as to actually go to Ferdinand Alfonsi's house with Herman Petrillo. But then he backed out. Good thinking, George. He just got out of jail. The last thing he needed was something that would land him back in the clink again. George was so freaked out by his experience with Herman Petrillo that he went to the Philadelphia police with a story about attempted murder, but the cops didn't believe him. George must have been a pretty tenacious dude because he didn't let that stop him from turning in Herman Petrillo. George Meyer went to see the head of the Philadelphia branch of the Secret Service, a man named William Lanvoy. But that might not actually be his real name because Billy Boy did a lot of undercover work. From what I read, this was the name that was given to the press and used in police reports, which I think is pretty freaking cool. Undercover work back in the 30s. Like, I imagine him walking around in a dark trench coat and a fedora, which probably would have been a dead giveaway that he was law enforcement. So that's probably not at all what he wore. But in my mind, that's exactly how he dressed. And like Philadelphia police, William Lanvoy was skeptical at first about the murder-for-hire scheme, but he did know who Herman Petrillo was, and he knew that he was wanted on suspicion of counterfeiting. And every time the city of Philadelphia or the Secret Service set up a sting operation to catch Herman Petrillo with counterfeit money on him, there was nothing. They came up empty-handed. So Lanvoy decided to dig around, and he assigned an agent, Stanley Phillips, to investigate. Phillips pretended he was an assassin for hire. Again, my mind pictures film noir double agent wearing a fedora, but he was probably dressed like a Depression-era day laborer. Agent Phillips and Harmon Petrillo meet, and Phillips says he heard about the hit and he was willing to step in for George, since George backed out. These two spent plenty of time talking about the best way to murder Ferdinand Alfonsi. Now, the crime ring's preferred method of killing was either poison, but that can take a while, and so far Alfonsi was still kicking or a sandbag to the back of the head. That doesn't do much damage to the outside, but on the inside of your skull, it's one hell of a hemorrhage. They even talked about hitting Ferdinand Alfonsi with a car, and Agent Phillips was hoping Herman Petrillo would either give him money to buy a car for the hit or pay him in advance. 
with counterfeit money. But Herman had trouble getting his hands on the fake cash right away, and this dragged on for weeks. Agent Phillips tried to buy counterfeit bills from Petrillo, but just like before, he said it would take him a while. Now, George Meyer wasn't out of the picture. He was so worried about Ferdinand Alfonsi, he went to his house pretending to be a contractor looking for work. Mrs. Alfonsi answered the door, and she said her husband was unwell and too ill to come and speak with George, and George knew exactly what that meant. The reason Harmon Petrillo wanted a hit on Alfonsi was because this dude just wouldn't die. His <laughs> wife had been pumping him full of arsenic all summer, and he got sicker and sicker, but he hung on. Not long after that, Herman Petrillo contacted Phillips and told him he had the counterfeit money Phillips wanted to buy. So, Agent Phillips, George Meyer, and Herman, they all meet at a bus stop in South Philly, and sure enough, Petrillo's got on him an envelope full of bogus $5 bills. So great, they finally got this asshole on counterfeiting, but the bigger issue is attempted murder. Agent Phillips asked Petrillo, What about that hit? Do you still want me to take out that guy Alfonsi? I'm down. And Herman Petrillo tells Phillips that his services in that capacity are no longer needed because Alfonsi is in the stomach hospital and probably won't be checking out. The stomach hospital? What the hell is a stomach hospital? Like, that's a thing? It sure as shit was. The American Hospital for Diseases of the Stomach. It sat at 1809 Wallace Street. It was established in 1896 to treat diseases of the gastrointestinal tract and other related ailments. Like, that'd be a real fun place to work. And like much of Philadelphia's medical history, this was the first hospital of its kind in the country. Today, it's a giant open space with what looks like co-op gardens, which is really cool. There's no remnants, though, of the stomach hospital. But in 1938, it's where Frank Alfonsi lingered for two months before finally succumbing to a mysterious illness. So at this point, Philly police have Herman Petrillo for counterfeiting, but that's all they have. They don't have him for murder. They don't have his cousin, Paul Petrillo. They don't have Morris Bulber, a.k.a. Louis the Rabbi. And they don't have the witch, Karina Maria Favado. The police tried to get Herman on attempted murder. But when Alfonsi died, well, now they had him for murder. And they could have had Herman and everyone else in this poison ring much sooner. Because everyone in the city knew about it. Including Philadelphia District Attorney Charles Kelly. Kelly was the DA in the 30s, and he'd heard numerous rumors about a cult who would poison victims. But he thought the stories were bizarre, and he was uncomfortable starting up an investigation over something so twisted. Seriously? It's the 30s. It's not like you had DNA testing to help solve cases. All you had at your disposal was rumor and speculation. That's the trail you have to follow. Fortunately for the city of Philadelphia, a new assistant district attorney was in town, a guy named Vince McDevitt. Vince grew up in West Philly. He was one of five children with a single mother. His father passed away when he was only 14. Vince and his older brother worked to help his mother provide for their siblings, and that was basically his childhood. Until the family burdens lightened, and then his mother pushed Vince to go back to school. He became an attorney in 1929, and less than 10 years later, he was the ADA in Philadelphia. He didn't think stories of the Poison Ring cult were too bizarre to investigate when he heard about Frank Alfonsi's death, with enough arsenic in his system to kill a few people. He knew Herman Petrillo had to be connected to the larger story, but ADA McDevitt didn't expect to get much out of this guy. He was a hardened criminal, a counterfeiter, the leader of a Poison Ring, and an actor. Like, Jesus, that's a hell of a resume. But McDevitt couldn't have been more surprised if he woke up with his head stapled to the carpet because when he questioned Herman Petrillo, he didn't sing like a canary, he sang like Mariah Carey. <laughs> he gave up his cousin Paul Petrillo. He gave up Morris Borbell. He gave up Karina Maria Favado and at least 10 other people. Herman Petrillo gave ADA McDevitt the names of victims, how they were murdered, who their wives were. Name after name came out. Three men, Dominic Carina, Prospero Lisi, and Peter Stea, they were all late husbands of the same woman, a woman named Rose Carina. She killed three men. Three. With the help of the Petrillo gang, she killed three husbands. 
There was Luigi Vivaccio. There was Antonio Romulato. Like, the list just went on and on. And it wasn't all men who were killed. There were mothers-in-law and there were wives on the hit list. And all but three of the victims died from arsenic poisoning. After the death of Ferdinand Alfonsi, Philadelphia police started exhuming bodies. And sure enough, the levels of arsenic were off the charts in at least 10 bodies that were exhumed. On March 21st, 1939, Herman Petrillo was convicted on multiple counts of murder and sentenced to death. All that singing he did had absolutely no effect on the judge or the jury. He was sentenced to die by electric chair. His cousin Paul Petrillo was also convicted on multiple counts of murder, and he too was sentenced to die by electric chair. Now, not for nothing, if you've read or watched The Green Mile, Old Sparky is a really heinous way to die. Your electricity shall now be passed through your body until you are dead. In accordance with state law, God have mercy on your soul. But these two were especially heinous, and they were both eventually put to death in 1941. Mars Bulber also pled guilty, and he was hoping that that would get him a lighter sentence for cooperating with the police. And I guess life in prison is lighter than death by electric chair, because that's what he got, life in prison. He was incarcerated at Eastern State Penitentiary and died after 14 years behind bars. Each time someone in the poison ring was arrested, the finger pointing was insane. Everyone dropped more and more names. People were indicted and turned state's evidence against one another, but there was so much murder and mayhem perpetrated by everyone that all that turning against one another did nothing to buy anyone lighter sentences. Besides the Petrillos and Morris Bulber, there were 13 people indicted and sent to prison for the Philadelphia poison ring. And of the women involved in this story, and there were many, Karina Maria Favado was the worst. When she was arrested, she pled not guilty even after the bodies of her last two husbands and stepson were exhumed and found to be full of arsenic. Her attorney argued there was no proof she actually administered the poison. Yeah, okay. But halfway through her trial, her conscience got the better of her and she pled guilty and got life in prison. Pretty much everyone got life in prison. It was like the Oprah Christmas episode. You get life in prison. You get life in prison. Everyone gets life in prison. Well, except the Petrillos, because, you know, the electric chair. Now, you might not expect me to say that I enjoyed researching a story with over 50 murders, maybe as many as 100 or more. But I enjoy every story I research. I mean, I don't enjoy murder, but I love digging into the more sordid side of Philadelphia's rich history. What I enjoy about stories like this one is looking back at Wallace Avenue where the stomach hospital stood and seeing what that neighborhood looks like today. I like walking through City Hall and wondering in which courtroom the Petrillo trial was held. I love reading about young assistant district attorney Vince McDevitt, who grew up in West Philly, where today the Mann Music Center now stands and the trolleys still run. I think of him with his first big case that no one else wanted to touch, but he broke it wide open. I think about Twisted Philly. This story and so many other stories are the foundation of this podcast, and I just always have more fun with episodes that travel back in time. I know earlier in this episode, I said I don't know how I could have lived during this time, but I don't know, maybe I was born in the wrong era. All I do know is I love this city, even though the fact that we had the largest poison ring in history is pretty fucked up. Go big or go home, Philly. So what's next for Twisted Philly between now and the end of the year? Well, there's a bonus holiday episode coming up. It's going to be something that's a little different than the usual fare, although there's really nothing usual about Twisted Philly other than me cursing and telling crazy stories and laughing at myself. I may take a little break over the holidays, and then again, I may not. And that's how it is with this podcast. If I'm not talking with all of you every week, I miss you, so I'll let you know. In the meantime, make sure if you're in the midst of a marital disagreement to prepare your own food. I'm just saying, that's it from me. Ciao for now, Twisters.